horse trainers, news vendors, speed skaters, bouncers, and more. One of Tom's great aunts even operated a rooming house for railway porters. Tom's family is arguably, arguably one of the most remarkable in Ottawa's history, and Tom is here tonight to tell us their story. But no story is ever simple when you stand out in a crowd for your ethnic or racial origin, if you look or sound strangely to those around you. And so tonight, Tom will also explore what it has been like, not just for people of African descent, but also those of other ethnic backgrounds who have come to our city and nation to make a new life. Tom has committed his life to exploring his family's past, even traveling south to where his grandfather's life began as a slave. Every year, Tom continues his research and makes new discoveries about the Barber family history and about life in the early days in general. As Richard mentioned, we remind everyone to please keep your audio on mute and your videos blank as, so as not to interfere with our speaker's presentation and our bandwidth. And we invite you to use the chat function to type your questions throughout the evening so that Tom can answer them afterward. Now this evening, Tom is doing a bit of an experiment. He has pre-recorded some of the narrative for his presentation. So if at some point you hear Tom's voice, but you don't see his lips moving, don't be alarmed. <laughs> We're thoroughly honored to welcome Tom Barber as our guest speaker this evening. Okay. I was going to put on the video right now. Okay, let's see. Okay, share. Okay. That looks good. Okay, and I will start the video from the beginning. Yeah. This presentation looks at the earliest Blacks, Chinese, Italians, and Jews that settled in Ottawa and compares their treatment here to other parts of Canada. I highlight the life of Paul Barber and family, letting you be the judge as to how this former slave's life. What did you do? The BC Fraser River Valley Gold Rush was the first major draw of Chinese to Canada. In China, okay. the population growth led to a land shortage and higher rents for farmland. Other push factors, such as floods and wars in China, made it hard for people to live in safety and peace or make a living. Chinese immigration increased as thousands arrived in the 1880s to build the CPR. After the completion of the railway in 1880s, oh, there was fervent anti-Chinese racism my, my after mistake. the railway was completed. Okay. It was further reinforced by the Chinese head tax that year. It started out as a $50 fee, eventually raised to $500. In 1915, the BC provincial government reported a revenue of $1,279,359 from the Chinese immigration tax. In Montreal, many Chinese were fined or imprisoned for protesting Montreal's prohibited licensing fees. Others were forced to close their businesses permanently. In Toronto in 1915, journalists, politicians, and others began to criticize the living and working conditions where Chinese people operated as overcrowded and unsanitary. While Jewish and Italian immigrants who conducted their businesses under similar conditions were not discriminated in this manner. In 1906, the St. John newspaper publishes a racist letter warning of filth and wretchedness that would result from increased Chinese immigration to the city. In 1909, 27 Chinese men were arrested for gambling at a laundry owned by St. John's Samoa. A judge deems the men not guilty, noting that white society ladies played friendly games of bridge without being arrested. Since there were no Chinese women, men met and played games to socialize, usually on a Sunday. During the Spanish flu of 1918, Many Chinese patients were refused treatment in many white hospitals in Montreal. Mother Delilah Tetro obtained permission from the civil and religious authorities to organize a small emergency shelter for the Chinese. The small seven bed infirmary opened for the Chinese men at 66 Clark Street. It cared for 55 Chinese men before it closed its doors on the 26th of June, 1919. And the four nursing sisters went back to their convent. The charitable gesture on the part of the church and of the Christians of Montreal was rewarded with two gold medals 
from the government of China. The first recorded Chinese in order was on wing. The Evening Journal reported a new sign on Spark Street. Su Wing, Mo Wing, and On Wing appear in the 1891 city directory and census. In Ottawa, the Chinese were basically restricted to laundry and cafes. Provincial laws forbade Chinese men from hiring and supervising white women. Chinese often lived and worked out of the storefront dwellings in the downtown core, usually rented to them from Jewish landlords. Police set up a stakeout to catch Chinese gambling on Sunday, September 10, 1906. On the 20th of April, 1897, Ottawa City Council voted to impose a $10 per year tax on Chinese laundries. Alderman Campbell said that the Chinese were law-abiding and always paid their water fees on time. The Evening Journal said that the tax was probably illegal and seemed in ill accord with British fair play. Recommended by review committee that the tax should be applied to all laundries, irrespective of the persons. It was never implemented. In 1911, the Ottawa Journal wrote stories shedding positive light on Chinese. How a local Chinese businessman was elected to the Chinese constitutional government. Chinese mothers, rich and poor, cared for their children the same as Canadians. The quick response of police to the robbery of a Chinese merchant on Sussex and a quick arrest. However, no conviction. Interracial marriages in Canada were rare at the time but not so surprisingly in Ottawa. Many Chinese bachelors had married or common law relationships with white women. Most times it was a French Canadian woman who saw merit in the Asian's ambition to own his own laundry or cafe. In 1908, Hum Yi Tommy marries Mary Levine in Woodstock. The Tommies were a highly talented Ottawa skiing family. Their sons, this year high school students, Andy, Art and Fred were selected to represent Canada on the National Alpine Squad. Andy Tommy became a pro football player with the Ottawa Rough Riders. Andy and Art went on to establish the skiing place to be for the younger crowd, Edelweiss Ski Resort. Along with Reg Lefebvre, together they built Tommy and Lefebvre ski shops. In 1497, Giovanni Caboto, John Cabot, an Italian navigator from Venice, explored and claimed the coast of Newfoundland for England. In the late 1800s, Italian immigration was fueled by severe poverty. Southern Italy, including the islands of Sicily and Sardinia, offered landless peasants little more than hardship, exploitation, and violence. Italian laborers in the 19th century worked seasonally in France, Austria, and Switzerland. By the 1880s, transatlantic steamer fares were cheaper than train travel to France, and wages were higher in North America. Financially, it became beneficial for single men to work in Canada for part of the year and return to Italy during the winter. Successful migrants who returned to Italy encouraged Italians to set out for North America. 80% of Italian immigrants were young males, most of whom went to work at seasonal heavy labor jobs in railroad construction and maintenance, mines and lumber camps. Laborers were often misled into indefinite migration to labor camps or found themselves unemployed and destitute in Canada's major cities. Italians who settled in Canada's growing cities worked as construction and factory workers or building tradesmen, others as merchants of food and fruit, or as artisans such as barbers and cobblers. Italians in the urban centers usually congregated in the same neighborhoods. Social activities and religious ceremonies were kept amongst themselves. Despite immigration restrictions post First World War, through sponsorship by relatives, over 30,000 had entered Canada before 1930. Many of them were farm laborers or wives and children. Bytown's first Italian resident was Signor Giuseppe, aka Jerome Fazio, born in Rome, 1789. He was a miniaturist portrait painter and landed in Montreal in 1834. He was commissioned in Montreal, Quebec, New York, and other cities along the St. Lawrence. He returned to Italy, but not for long as he returned to Canada in 1850. 
He set up a shop in Ottawa to paint and teach. He died January 2nd, 1851, at age 59. His works are on display in the galleries of the Musée du Quebec, the Musée du Seminaire du Chitoutimi, the McCord Museum, and the National Gallery of Canada. To the left is a portrait by Fazio. Ottawa had Italian families registered in the 1881 Census of Canada. Alfred Bizzano, statue maker, migrated to Canada in 1850. He was married to a French Canadian woman, Marguerite Metevier, and one child, Maria Rose Ida. Joseph Loren was a marble worker, painters by trade, Francis Biaggi and Stefano Muscardino. Jacob Cursau was a shoemaker and moonlighted as a cab driver. Raphael Gesso, or Greco, was a day laborer. Johnny Varello was registered as a peddler. Himo Lamotte, born in Italy in 1851, but was considered a French citizen. As well, Himo lived in Victoria Ward and was a civil servant. Most of these Italian immigrants resided in Lower Town and married French Canadian women. The next wave of Italians to the city came around 1907. From around 1908 to 1913, the Italians of Ottawa attended the Chapel of Notre Dame for religious ceremonies. It was located at 145 Murray Street between Cumberland and the Lucy Streets. Just as with many other ethnic groups, we see in Ottawa mixed marriages were commonplace. This should come as no surprise as Italian men would have learned other languages working around Europe. They also had few choices for mates as their English would have been poor at best and there were no Italian women to court. In 1913, Ottawa's Italian community numbered about 150 families and lived in the Booth, Preston and Rochester neighborhood. They built St. Anthony of Padua Church. It was located at Gladstone and Booth and was deemed as the National Italian Church. Culturally and socially, they tended to stay within their own community. There was one occasion noted about an ethnic religious disturbance. A group of Orangemen attempted to disrupt an Italian religious ceremony. The darkest period for Italians was during World War II, where 31,000 males were interned as enemy aliens. Even though many were born in Canada, this was due to Italy declaring war on Britain. Prior to 1900, push mechanism for Jewish immigration was that the Tsars never considered the Jews Russians, only people who resided there. The pull mechanisms was the offering of free land in the frontier towns of the West and the right to vote. Jews, as well as Danes, Germans, Englishmen, and Scotsmen, all suffered the same failures at farming in the West. Only the Jews were labeled as a people not suited to being successful farmers. Jews were hated because they were the most visible element of this mongrelization of Canada. It was only after a law was passed, both in the Lower Canada Assembly and the Council, and received the Royal Assent, June 5, 1832, extended the same political rights to Jews as to Christians. Canadian elite political leaders, teachers, and intellectuals felt Jews did not fit the concept of what a Canadian should be. Anti-Semitism was particularly strong in Quebec, Ontario, and out west. Jews were attacked by the church's press and in some instances suffered physical abuse. Jews spoke out in opposition to anti-Jewish immigration laws. Other immigrants granted status, but why not Jews? A ship was denied entry halfway to Canada. In 1861, Ottawa's population was 14,699, its Jewish population, four. Recognized as the city's earliest Jewish settler is Moses Bilski, here in 1860. He That's left to try his hand at the gold rush. When you're successful finished. at that, to pay for his way back, he joined the Union Army in San Francisco. He was wounded in the leg during some skirmishes, a direct result 
of civil unrest after the assassination of U.S. President Abraham Lincoln. Eventually, he returned in 1869 to Ottawa. Kosher products in Ottawa were non-existent. Bilski himself went to Montreal to learn how to cut kosher meat. Still, the city needed a rabbi. Ottawa's first rabbi was brought here from New York by John Dover, Moses Bilski, and most likely Aaron Rosenthal, a jeweler and silversmith. They were seeking a person to not only serve as rabbi, but as cantor, shishat, that's someone who performs ritual slaughter, and moyal as well. Jacob Mursky was selected. By 1901, there were 400 Jews in Ottawa. Mursky's sons established Pure Spring Soft Drink Company. <clears throat> Many Jewish immigrants lacked skilled trades and found it necessary to go into the peddling business. A license to peddle in Ottawa was only a dime. While in Montreal, it was $25. There were no regulations to open commercial establishments, making it easy to start a home-based business either in the front room or backyard. If you notice, this guy is right across from where Irving Rivers would be today. Jacob Friedman arrived in Ottawa in 1891. In 1892, he married Leah Phillips from Cornwall. He initially sold butter, eggs, fruit and vegetables door to door in Sandy Hill and the lower town areas. He opened his first store in 1894 in the Byward Market Square. Later, he established the J. Friedman & Son Wholesale Grocery, which became the largest wholesale grocery in eastern Ontario and western Quebec. It was located on the west side of Byward Street between George and York Streets. And you can see it there in the left side of the photographs. And I think it's probably where the Mercury Lounge is today. Jewish children would have attended public schools. Ottawa recreation facilities were open to all except for the private golf clubs and similar organizations. The Jewish community felt the need to establish their own organizations and a cemetery, Jewish memorial gardens. There were competitive games between Jews and Christians, some even publicized. Notice who the unbiased umpire was, Paul Barber Jr. Sport certainly broke any stereotypical generalizations of Jews not being good athletes. They also had their own sports leagues. Jews have been active in the civil service in Ottawa since 1857, when Emmanuel Hyman Benjamin was appointed to the post office department in the city. In 1902, Samuel Rosenthal was the first of several Jewish aldermen in Ottawa. Lori Greenberg was elected mayor of Ottawa December 2nd, 1974, becoming the first Jew to head Canada's capital city. Lori was born and raised in Lower Town and went to Lisgar Collegiate. In 1955, he and his brothers, Irving, Gilbert, and Louis, joined forces to found Minto Construction Company Limited, which became one of the city's most successful construction and real estate companies. Intermarriages were fewer between the Jews and other denominations, but they still did happen. Jack Schumann married Veronica Ronnie Pender, a Catholic in Ottawa, 29th November 1958. Other than resentment and jealousy from poor residents, there was very little overt racism towards Jews. The first Ottawa Gatineau black resident was a free man from Massachusetts, London, Oxford. He was a member of Philemon Wright's original pioneering group that came to Gatineau in 1800. London, Wright's friend and associate, was one of the four men that transported 700 logs and 6,000 barrel staves from Wrightville along the treacherous waters of the Ottawa and St. Lawrence rivers to Quebec City. The first recorded black settlers of Bytown were Perry Adams and Henrietta Joyce. Their child, Francis, was baptized at Notre Dame Cathedral in 1844 by Father Kelman, an oblate. Father Telman only arriving in Bytown in March 1844. 
In the mid-1840s, Bytown was a rough and tumble place, severely lacking in medical facilities. Elizabeth Briere and five sisters to charity, Grey Nuns, arrived by sleigh to set up a civilian hospital and help in schools. On May 10th, they opened a seven-bed hospital on St. Patrick Street. Dr. Edward Van yes. Cortland of the garrison donated his services to the hospital. The first patients were a Pierre Etier, a consumptive, and a young black man from Bermuda, fondly known as Boldenage, suffering from a gangrenous foot that had been frozen in the lumber camp. In 1878, boat builder Samuel Rancel resided at 554 St. Patrick Street. He had a white Catholic Irish wife, Annie and six Quebec-born children. Soon to follow, William Louis Armstrong, an Ontario-born black man, and his Irish wife, Ellen, their two daughters, and an American black woman, Jane Smith. Jobs across Canada for blacks were primarily limited to the service sector jobs, barbers, waitstaff, janitors, laundresses, domestics, and general laborers. Blacks did not traditionally get hired in provincial and federal government agencies. In the mid-1880s, Paul leaves Bardstown, Kentucky, and travels about the states. When he left Bardstown, his former slave owners gave him $100 and a suit of clothes. He thought this was a great thing. Paul Barber, all-round horseman, trainer, vet, and sulky driver, ends up in Ottawa. Paul worked for the Candace Stables in the early 1890s. I suspect on previous deliveries of horses from the barber farms, he was well received. Following in Paul's train tracks from the barber horse farms, Alex Rogers in the mid-1890s brings a train car load of horses to the McCandish Stables. Later in the decade comes John Smith, also from Bardstown, who was older than Paul and worked for Felitas Barber, their former slave owner. As an aside note, the grass on Parliament Hill is Kentucky bluegrass. In October 1892, Paul Barber married Elizabeth Brown from Amazon County, that's in the Renfrew area. The service was performed by Reverend John Wood at the Congregational Church. They had six children, but only five survived. Emily Cecilia Barber was born in 1902 and died the same year. They had Paul Jr., born 1893, John, a.k.a. Jack, born 1895, Mary, born 1897, and Joseph, born 1899, and Thomas, 1904. Like in other ethnic families, every member contributed as best they could to the household. The Barbers were a very successful working class family. You get to show her new husband to her parents. Paul and Elizabeth soldiered up to the Renfrew area by horse and buggy. Being a late fall night, Paul put the horse in the barn after the long trek. Elizabeth anxiously went into her parents' home to tell the great news. When Paul walked through the doorway, Mary, my great-grandmother, exclaimed, Good God, you married the devil. As she was Prussian, I believe she said it in Low German. Paul grew up in an area that was mostly German, outside of Louisville. I firmly believe he answered her in German. He broke the ice for Alex Rogers to marry Elizabeth's younger sister, Janet. Black families lived in different wards of the city. By ward, Central Ward, St. George's Ward, Wellington Ward. There was no concentration or centralized area where blacks lived. The city's elite employed blacks in various jobs. Both William LaPorche, a chef, and William Mullock, cook, worked for Sir Henry Bate at his prestigious Russell Hotel. Sir Henry Bate was the first commissioner of the Ottawa Improvement Committee and the city's largest wholesale merchant. William Wilson and Samuel Ranzel Jr. worked as engineers for J.R. Booth, the lumber baron on his Canada Atlantic Railroad. 
Luke Johnson, a Mason, reported income of $600 for 1900. A single mother, Jessie Richardson, was a scaler. A scaler's job is to assess species, quality, usability, and conformity of cut wood. While both Abby McClary and Rachel Mayfair worked as domestics, common for single women at the time. Additionally, on the Quebec side lived Noah Robinson, a coachman. There are many newspaper stories about Paul Barber. While most to do with horse racing results, there are others about his different life experiences. He claimed to have a coin worth $1,000. It was just the start of stamp and coin collecting that runs in our family. The newspaper race results show that Paul raced horses throughout the area and not just in the city. From the late 1880s to 1900s, Paul worked at various jobs, coachman, horse trainer, vet, raising horses all the while. Paul Barber's equine skills garnered him the respect of many powerful Ottawa elite. Hugh Carson, Harry Brown, Sir Henry Bate, and Llewellyn Bate, Sir Henry's son and president of the Ottawa Senators, and MP Dr. Shabbat to name a few. Paul placed ads in the city of Ottawa directories. Paul gets hired by the city in 1905, becoming the first black employee of the city of Ottawa. The importance of this article cannot be overstated. In 1908, it showed a colored gun, gentleman, Paul, being able to have a complaint about a white neighbor heard in a white court. It is the only article I have found that actually quoted my grandfather as he spoke. It showed Paul's confidence to speak his mind, maybe like the rest of us barbers, a little too much. Henry Cole Jr. was accused by a colored Yemen named Paul Barber with trespassing on his premises on Clarence Street. The dispute arose over a common yard, the parties living side by side. The magistrate decided that he had no jurisdiction in the case, so dismissed the charge. I've always had this head yard, remarked Paul, for my wood, and I won't allow no person to prevacate on my property. If this head cool person trespassificates any more, I certainly will demonstrate, Johanna, I certainly will demonstrate. In 1909, Paul received a letter stating he is a benefactor in the will of Cecilia Barber, the former slave owner's wife. Some of the highlights of the newspaper coverage included Paul Barber, colored of 376 Clarence Street, Paul Barber, than whom there is none of his race better known in the city. Paul was a trusted employee and considered family. The lawyer handling the estate did not know the address, but the last known address for Paul was 26 Redan Street, which was obviously meant to be 26 Riedel Street. Paul asked local lawyer Mr. E. P. Gleason to look after his interests. In 1910, the Barbers purchased a house at 19 St. Joseph Street in Lower Town. They bought the home off a Jewish peddler, Moses Ellenberg. The purchase price was $1,100, which the barbers paid $550 down and the rest mortgaged. A story from my Aunt Mary that always makes me laugh was an incident that occurred not long after the barbers bought their home. My great aunt Mariah was visiting her sister Elizabeth, my grandmother. Although she was married, she distrusted men and was a temperance leader. After a successful day at the races, both my grandfather Paul and my uncle Paul staggered up the laneway, holding each other up quite drunk. My great aunt, thoroughly disgusted, announced all men are drunkards and that she was not leaving any of her money to her nephews. After leaving the stables, Alex Rogers works at Carling Brewery on Wellington as a laborer. Despite there being restrictions on blacks entering Canada, the railways negotiated a deal with the federal government that allowed black American men to work on trains in Canada. 
At the new Grand Trunk Central Station, Alec works as a laborer, cleaning rail cars. As an aside business arrangement, Alex and his wife, the former Jeanette Brown, a white woman, are paid by the Grand Trunk Company to put up porters and other railway workers of color who have overnight stays in Ottawa. Their lodgings on Bezra Street became known as a welcoming place for blacks passing through the city well into the 1940s. Joseph Porter, charged with assaulting a white woman, had his day in Ottawa court in 1889. His side of the story was supported by the investigating officer and the case was dismissed. Another incident where the byline read, two Negroes fighting, Paul Barber confronted John Turner, 32, on dating his 16-year-old daughter, Mary. Besides both men needing medical attention, Turner was fined $6 and Barber was found not guilty. In the witness box, Barber tells the judge, if I had a knife, I would have given it to him good and stiff. <laughs> Elizabeth Barber was a very enterprising woman who raised money for the Barber household in many ways. She took on seamstress work, used her talent to make all her family's clothes. The family did catering jobs for wealthy households. Elizabeth was also known to feed hungry neighborhood children, quite often Jewish. Jack Smith, son of the shoemaker, comes to mind. Famous restaurateur David Smith's older brother. Paul Jr. had a newspaper stand on the northwest corner of Bank and Sparks, outside Ketchum's department store. All the Barber boys went to St. Bridget's. Every year, the names of the passing students would be published in Ottawa newspapers. Both Paul Jr. and Jack were honor students. At Christmas time, Paul's additional job was being Ketchum Santa Claus. One time, a policeman suspected Paul Jr. of stealing a late delivered box of toques that was left outside the store. Paul Jr. had gathered them up for safekeeping. Another officer vouched for Paul, and the store rewarded him with a wagon to help get his papers from the train station to his stand. On another occasion, Paul Jr. stopped a runaway horse. Paul Jr. acquired more new stands and hired young men to work for him. In 1915, Paul Jr. visited his sister Mary in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. He returned to Ottawa with a rare car Harley Davidson. Pictured in everyday clothes is Paul with Mary's sister-in-law, Flo Matthews. For all the barber boys, their color seemed to be an advantage with white women. Paul Jr. often had more than one motorcycle. It took Paul three times to be finally accepted by the medical enlistment officer, Dr. Davies. Paul was previously rejected due to a bad heart. His race was noted on his medical papers, Negro. While in the service, he was in the motor corps where he drove motorcycles as a dispatch rider, trucks and ambulances. If he had any racial discrimination experiences, he never talked about them. He seemed to have a good relationship with everyone. He was gassed and spent time in an English military hospital. Later in life, he did have heart issues. In 1922, he married Ruby Boston, who he met at Bowles Lunch on Bank Street. They had nine surviving children, two girls and seven boys. Elite City Club segregation membership, not a consideration for the Barbers. In 1917, Paul was a founding member of the Ottawa Motorcycle Club. He was one of its officers in charge of recruitment. That year, there was almost 200 motorcycle owners in the city. A big thrill for boys who worked for Paul was a ride in his sidecar. Paul raced his motorcycles in Ontario, Quebec, and Upper State, New York. Jack, aka John Barber, attended St. Bridget's School on Murray Street. Jack got in trouble for not doing his homework. He got the strap for it. His mother kept him home because she felt the punishment was too severe. She threatened to put him in a public school. 
His teacher sent a letter home stating that Jack was exempt from apologizing and having to do his homework. He sold newspapers in front of Bait Department Store located at 109 and 111 Spark Street, bounded by Metcalf and O'Connor Streets. The Bait Building addition introduced Ottawa to one of its first elevators. It was manually operated, so when the operator took his lunch break, Jack would fill in, taking customers from the ground floor to one of four floors. Jack was also the water boy for the Ottawa Senators in 1909, but it wasn't water he was bringing the players to stay warm in the old, cold, drafty arenas. Jack had an ambulance ride, a doctor removed the bullet, and he was admitted to Water Street Hospital. It was the old General, now Elizabeth Briere Center. Many places in North America would not have allowed blacks access to these services. Paul Jr. had more than one motorcycle and Jack wanted to take one for a ride. Paul Jr. would never let him. One evening, after selling papers, Paul Jr. came home tired. He ate and went to bed early. Jack saw his chance. He pushed one of the bikes down to St. Patrick Street so Paul Jr. wouldn't be woken up by its motor. He took the bike over the Rideau River to New Edinburgh, around to the Minto Bridges, up Canward, down St. Patrick, stopping at the top of St. Joseph and walking the bike home. A few days later, Jack asked Paul how his bikes were running. No sooner did Paul Jr. say, fine, Jack told him about the ride. Uncle Jack told me if Paul Jr. knew he had taken his bike, he might have said there was something wrong or blamed him if anything was not right. During World War I, Jack was drafted. He tried to use his color as a reason for rejection, but the recruitment officer snapped back. For the war, you're white, but after that, watch out. His mother had a lawyer send a letter describing how Jack was the breadwinner, but to no avail. Jack never saw action in France because of various incidences. On the way to England, Jack's ship ran aground. When he finally got to England, his unit was quarantined off and on because of measles or the mumps. He was once asked if he would feel more comfortable in an all-color unit, but he told them the group of guys he was with were his friends and the other guys were strangers to him. Jack won money in a race with over 200 runners from all parts of the world. Jack married Annie Tweedley and had one daughter. Jack was part of the Interprovincial Midget Hockey Champions, sponsored by the Bait and Southern families, owners of the Ottawa Citizen. The owners of the Senators acknowledged Jack's hockey abilities were certainly good enough to make their NHL team. But outside of Ottawa, he would suffer taunts and other abuse because of his race. Jack told me how he and locals would play baseball in Strathcona Park with many of the black railway workers. He was part of the executive of a newly formed baseball league. Jack was asked to try his hand or, or feet at speed skating. He became one of the best skaters in his class, coached, officiated, and became the long-serving president of Speed Skating Canada. He said his color was no barrier in that sport. That. He was inducted into both the Ottawa and the Ontario Sport Halls of Fame. Mary attended Our Lady School. It was an all-girls school at the time, located at the northeast corner of Cumberland and Murray Streets. She told me of the only time she had been the recipient of a racial comment. A girl at school called her Jack Johnson. Insulted and angry, she bit her. There were no repercussions from school authorities or from any other students. Mary helped her mother with the laundry service they provided. The barbers were financially able to hire a piano teacher, Irving Matthews, for their daughter Mary. As noted earlier, Paul Sr. was concerned about men dating Mary. Mary and her piano teacher wrote a song, Be My May May May, which was registered by Washington publishers. Mary and Irving eloped in 1914 and moved to Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, USA. Moving out of Ottawa, Mary experienced racism. 
They temporarily came back to Ottawa, then moved to Toronto. The couple had three boys. In Toronto, her husband became abusive. They separated and he moved back to Fond du Lac. In Toronto, she worked as a hairdresser and as an usher for famous players theaters. These were the only fields her color allowed her to work in Toronto. The 1916 city directory shows that Joe and Tom worked as ushers at the Imperial Theater on Bank Street. Joe would have been 17 and Tom 12. That is Joe in his usher's uniform in a picture taken on St. Joseph Street. The brick building behind Joe is still there. What remains of St. Joseph Street is now called Forzy Street. The imp, as it was known, was the brain thrust of Ottawa businessman Harry Brouse, who was also an avid horseman. The theater was described as opulent, elegant, beautiful, a sense of legitimacy for moving picture business among the upper middle class. Joe was the city's best boxer in his weight class and won the medal to prove it. Joe boxed in front of almost 3,000 at the drill hall at Cartier Square. He also fought at other venues. Joe went to Montreal for a fight and experienced extreme racist slurs and was spat at and more. He almost quit boxing, but turned to fighting for his militia unit. Joe served in between the war years as a member of the Governor General's Foot Guard Militia. Newspaper articles show that he boxed for the unit against other militia units around the city. Photos depict him with the rank of corporal. Joe later worked in the government for public works. Joe was described as a brown bomber long before Joe Lewis. He was also described as a darkie from St. Bridget's. Joe married Marion Frost, an Algonquin woman, in 1922. They had three boys and one girl. Joe fathered two other children to two other women. They separated, Marion died. Okay, I'm going to change that. Okay. <laughs> Tom Barber started at St. Bridget's School at age five. You can see by the way he was dressed that his mother, Elizabeth, took great pride in her sewing and the perception of her family. The Barbers had no issues having white friends of both sexes. One wintry day after school, Tom was walking home with one of his classmates along St. Patrick Street. His Irish buddy was complaining about a sore eye. Tom said, here, try this on it. That feels better, replied his friend. What is it? Tom told him it was a squashed piece of horse manure that was run over by the streetcar. Tom said his buddy chased him all the way home. He too was a good runner. Tom was employed by Hugh Carson even during the depression. In this 1932 picture, Tom is seated in the front row. Carson moved business interests from bridle and carriage maker to garage services to luggage maker, recognized as one of the best made suitcases in Canada. Tom worked for Carson first as a mechanic and later when the business changed, direction as a driver. Hugh Carson had in his will that Tom Barber could never be fired. Tom married Catherine K. Hilton in 1943. She was introduced to him by his sister-in-law, Ruby. They had four children, two girls and two boys. Before they met, she had one child, a girl. The newspaper table was a gift from Hugh Carson. The table today, it sits in our living room. Okay. Tom's military records are void of any indication of his race. His military training had him travel to various bases across Canada. Comments on his leadership and work ethic were very positive. Such as, Sergeant Barber is a witty, pleasant fellow whose employment record, both in the Army and in civilian life, would indicate a very steady man. Tom started out as a private and at war's end was acting sergeant. There are many photos of him with fellow white soldiers. 
Even during the war, my father had a sense of humor. His best practical joke took place in 1945 at Halifax Dockyards. The Merchant Navy brought needed supplies over to England. One item that didn't get mentioned much were military coffins. My father happened to be in dockyards as a shipment of coffins were being loaded. He hid inside a coffin and when a young soldier went to move it, he sprang up making an eerie sound, scaring the private so badly he was running on the spot. Tom returned to his pre-war employer. He, like many others, faced the housing shortage in Ottawa. Squatting on abandoned bases was the only option for some veterans. To get them out, Mayor Charlotte Witten threatened to turn off the power. In response, Tom took a leadership role in demanding action to relocate vets and their families to pseudo homes by starting a petition. Ottawa Hall was a booming place. Wood byproduct industries and government kept everyone employed. Blacks and other ethnic groups endured various degrees of segregation in other parts of Canada. It would be naive to think that in Ottawa there was no racial bias, but it was of a milder manner. As well, many in the governing and business class spoke out against such actions. Ottawa civic leaders were much more liberal thinking than in other cities. There was always a sense of fair play and not to be American. Many immigrants brought or developed skills and trades needed to make Ottawa a world-class capital city. Access to medical facilities, lawyers, cheap licenses, along with a few regulations, made it easy to start a business and make roots in the city, regardless of ethnicity. Culture reflected social relations, and sport was the liveliest and defining activity. At the top was horse racing. It was a reflection of the interests of both the business community along with the vice regal and civil service groups of government. This certainly bode well for Paul Barber. He always felt comfortable and confident to speak his mind. He came to this city with something to offer and made it a better place. For the Barbers, their race was never an obstacle. When one door closed, it was try another one. Or try, try again. By most standards, black or white, the Barbers were a well-off family. They had respect, agency, and influence in the Ottawa community. The Barbers were part of the city, and the city was part of who the Barbers were. The Barbers had a disposable income they used for recreation and leisure activities. They had access to doctors, lawyers, religious and civic leaders, and were not hesitant to call upon them. Paul Barber and his family were not Ottawa's first black family, and he wasn't the first to be married to a white woman in Ottawa. But Paul's life story is unique. Quite the accomplishment for a former black slave and his white rural wife who could neither read nor write. That's it. Well, that's, that's fantastic, uh, Tom. And before um, Richard gets into the questions, I think I'd like to ask you a question. Okay. Were, were there were there any barbers who, who weren't afraid to speak their minds and stand up? <laughs> Not that we, uh, uh, you know, recognize or uh, get them out of the family. No, I don't think so. <laughs> we haven't got any questions yet. Everyone, don't be shy, folks. Uh, you questions. know what happened? One thing that happened, there were a few slides with glitches in, and I went through and I edited it, but I think I gave Dom the good copy. <laughs> 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 there were a few glitches, but I only I would notice it because well, everything looked nice. I do have one a question more about your neighborhood. Uh, on, in Sandy Hill on Stewart Street, uh, very close to the entrance to the University of Ottawa, there's a, an older house, 1920s, and there's still the Star of David uh, on the top of the oh, house. Do you know what that house is? Do you know anything about it? You know what? Actually, I did. And you're raising that question. I did know a little bit about it, but I, 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 it uh, escapes me now. But there was one house along there in that same road at Stewart Street that was the, uh, it was a home and operating system of, uh, what's the name? It's, it, it, they were photographers and my cousin Frank worked for them. So the newspapers didn't have their own photographers. They get a phone call and they say, go to this thing or go to that thing. And uh, they, um, geez, the name, why does the name escape me? Newman, Newman's Photography Studios. And it was actually located in that 
area. I don't even know if that was the house. You seem to be smiling, Richard. Um, yeah. well, I'm but, not too uh, sure. I remember, uh, I, and it was only a story. I thought whether you could confirm whether it's just a story or not. I think the gentleman's last name was Pedagorsky. Okay. And the reason he put the Star of David on there is because at the time in the 1920s, when U Ottawa was very much a Catholic school, they didn't welcome uh, Jewish students. And so I guess he just stuck the Star of David in the front of his house where everyone could see it kind of as a, you know, <laughs> a, <taunt? laughs> you know a, a comment to the people yeah. that were out there. It was just a rumor I wondered. I thought it was kind mm -hmm. of an interesting story if it were true. Mm -hmm. We're getting lots of questions now. So hang on, I gotta okay. get caught up uh, and find out where he, is it, oh, no, no, no. it sounds like, uh, I'm trying to, where are we? Uh, uh, were there ever any barbers? Oh yeah, no, that was that was better. Were there any barbers? Were sorry about speaking to mine. Thank you, uh, Tom. Would would the three Mary Matthew boys be in Toronto or where? Do you know anything, Tom? Where would the three Mary Matthews boys be? Do you know anything about that? Okay, so um, one, I think Norman was the oldest. He was born in Fond du Lac. I think he was pregnant. She was pregnant for him when they uh, eloped. Uh, then there was Clifford. And then there was Paul. Paul was the only one actually when they returned to Ottawa in and he was born in 1919 here in Ottawa. So she, my aunt really didn't have, um, let's say much luck. She should never have left Ottawa. Uh, Cause she even admitted how, you know, one time she told us how great they were treated here in Ottawa. And uh, I said to my brother, I don't really believe her. This was in the sixties. Like it was too good to be true with all the race riots going on. You know, she, I said, is she just saying this to make us feel good? Anyways, actually, the, the real story was, was actually better than what she had told us. And, uh, but anyway, she left Ottawa, and she did face racism. She always would go down to the States to see different relatives that we had there, and she would talk about racism and how the boys were treated and basically carded. And, uh, no, she left. She had her, her children. And then what happened to one was that he, uh, the oldest one, he was working on the... Uh, I guess uh, in the spring when the St. Lawrence Seaway opened up because it was before the St. Lawrence Seaway was opened up all year long. He, he uh, one year he said to her, he says, I don't think I'm gonna go on the ship. He used to work the ships. Uh, and then she said, well, if you don't go this year, they may not take you next year. So she sort of guilted him into going and he went and you know, and this is the information I got from my uncle because nobody ever spoke of him. And what happened is somehow, he drowned in the Great Lakes. Like, was he thrown overboard? Was he, you know, like, he, he was just left blank and not questioned. So that's what happened to Norman. Clifford, Clifford died. He's buried in Toronto. He had diabetes and she had no money to have him treated back then. And of course, the treatments were just starting. It was just there. And their last son, because of his religion, he wasn't uh, getting uh, medical attention. And she came in, this was in the early 70s, I think probably around 1970. That's Paul. But Paul had two children. And some of them maybe some of his great grandchildren may be on this because I got in touch with him, uh, with them, either through, uh, it was through Ancestry. And anyway, so this is, um, and so he died in, he worked, he, he was a magist, musician and he worked in, um, in Detroit, he actually lived in Lansing and he worked at the auto, one of the auto factories. I can't remember which one. But anyways, he died uh, in his house. He was, he was dead and then he, was, he had a military uh, funeral. And he was, um, uh, I'm not to, what's the, um, he had three Gravy Awards. Uh, what's that? Bronze Stars. He had three Bronze Stars, is that it? Um, he, was awarded, he was in the Navy and he was awarded three Bronze Stars for his service for action that he, he, he had. So he had, they had quite a story and we lost contact with that side of the family. Both his two children died early in their, in their 30s. So we were actually, so it was only till uh, ancestry got the idea that I was able to uh, make a headway. Here's one uh, I think you'll find interesting. My children learned street karate from Earl Barber. That's his my brother. brother was a, and it says his brother was a bouncer at the Chaudière over my cousin home. was a bouncer at the Shoddy Air, and my brother actually worked as a bouncer at uh, Disco Viva. It's a respectable job, actually, you know, to be a bouncer. <laughs> uh, and I'm, there's a couple more that are coming in here. I'm gonna, uh, Where else can you be a, a, a colored person get to beat up white people with no reason? <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone has here, the role of sports as, as a platform for relationship building seems to come through. 
uh, is this an accurate understanding of your family story? And is sports something we should be investing in more given Ottawa's growing diversity? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a good question. And uh, I certainly have to say yes, because as we saw with uh, some of the Jewish people, that they played sports, you know, and I and I said before when I talked about this and I point this out about the the uh, baseball game that they had, and I said, who would have thought the Jews won, you know? And it's, uh, you know, it, it it really does break barriers, right? And so when you have people competing against each other, you know, if people want to know another story about Lower Town, is to read um, Angel Square by Brian Doyle. I don't know how many people have you on the in uh, with you guys have, want, have read it but it really is a good story and it talks about you know the kids being you know fighting you know the french the irish and the jews fight each other when they have to go through anglesey square to go to school so it's uh, it um and then they go downtown and they see the adult jews frenchmen and, and uh catholics uh irish catholics all talking and getting along you know so it's just uh an interesting story about that. Yeah, but sport, you know, sport, the Jews, by the, the Catholics had, uh, well, they, a lot of the Irish, they jumped on Jerry Barber's uh, shoulders, you know, that he's our hero. Uh, the French had, um, had uh, Lally, uh, Lally Lalonde, he was their hero. And the Jews had uh, Mo uh, Goldfield. And you don't hear much, of, you know, the Goldfield brothers had the butcher shop on Murray Street, but Mo left Ottawa, but he was supposedly a big man and a tough man. So everybody had their sort of hero. You know, neighbors are heroes, so uh, it's just interesting to see. And of course, you know, later on, everybody got along. We got a response about that from someone by the name of Michael Barber. It says, yes, I would agree with my older cousin, Tom. It can sometimes be cheaper than court costs. So I guess it, about <laughs> yeah, uh, getting sports to get people together. So you got some mm -hmm. support there. That's it for questions. Uh, there's okay. a lot of, of uh, chat here, but it's mostly it's dozens of people thanking you for a great okay. talk tonight. So uh, Ben, I'll pass things over to you. Mm -hmm. The only thing with this oh. is I have, can I just say, I have sure. a you guys showing yourselves if i had to do my presentation and have that bar across i would have missed half the things to read we'll make sure you get that lynn i think has a uh she can send you all the chat because there's dozens of people thanking you tonight so yeah we'll make oh, sure that, that's all right that. I, that's all right there's and you know uh, they may be thanking me but there were still a lot of stories i haven't told there because i only had so much room but i hope people if, if they can hear me um, I hope people realize that uh, the main part, and I went over this with Ben, is that so many other groups were here a long time ago, and for them not to sh just to think that Ottawa belonged to, you know, one dominant group. And then I was thinking about it, I was thinking, how did the French get here? <laughs> you know, when you think about it, it was mostly Anglos uh, at first. And that'd be an interesting story for someone to uh, look into, to write about how we had the French Canadians. I'm pretty sure it's something to do with Philman Wright going to Quebec City and saying, hey, come on. <laughs> you know. Well, Tom, that, that had a lot to do with the lumber industry. Um, but right. Tom, I wanted to thank you very much for tonight's presentation. Um, um, people love hearing about the Barber family, and you and I have talked about that, and I've said that, uh, you know, the, the Barbers may have been Ottawa's most remarkable Black family, but even if it was the Black family, the Barbers definitely have been one of Ottawa's most remarkable families outright. There's been too little in written form about the Barber family history. You've done so much work. Um, there are newspaper articles around. Uh, when you and I, uh, when I was at your place on the weekend, I said, really, what we need to do is, is to get this in writing. And the Historical Society has the format for that. We have our pamphlet series. And I take a look at your presentation tonight. I think we definitely have an outline for that. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if you're interested, you and I can work together. I think we can come up with, with something permanent that can be shared with people that really tells the family story. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty encompassing, pretty... pretty um, well, it's pretty amazing when you look at what happened to black people in other parts of the country, you know, and how they were treated and how this guy walks around and goes around like he's king of the walk, you know. You know, his color, he, did, he must have been colorblind, you know, really. But, but actually, part of that confidence came from his slave life, which is a, a whole story in itself that I can talk about. Well, you point. know, one of the things that, that I noticed that was being remarkable was that your grandfather 
garnered respect throughout his life. And the fact that his former owner's widow would have included him in her will really is just, it, it just comes full circle to the type of respect he, he got in Ottawa. Uh, what I'd like to do at this point is if anybody else at this point would like to unmute to ask additional questions or make comments, we could certainly accommodate that if anybody wants to make any other comments or ask questions right now. Sure. Don't be shy. I do have one more question, Tom. <laughs> maybe, you'd, maybe mentioned that one, you'd mentioned that one of the few occupations available to people of African descent was being a barber. Were there any barbers in the barber family? Uh, not, oh yeah, you, actually there is. There is a hairdresser, Darlene. She might be on uh, on board. I don't know. Uh, you know, yeah, she she speaks her mind. That's Jerry Barber's daughter, so is no doubt right? she can speak her mind. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I, I have a comment. Okay. When I was eighteen, and we used to go to the Shot Air Club, <laughs> I remember one night your cousin Jerry putting some guy right on his bum down the stairs and he wasn't a huge man he wasn't six foot five or anything but he was built like a tank and he was notorious he was feared by everybody and the young punks would come out and try to take him on and i don't think he ever lost a fight and uh it was quite the experience that was about over 40 years ago yeah well there, there were a few that he lost but uh you know as Earl mccray said there isn't anybody else who would fight four or five people a night and whether he won or lost, just get right back up, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and so that was that. Unfortunately, that's probably also what killed him. Well, also in the family, they did, there are some that have bad hearts. There is a bit of a, that trait, that gene that flows through it. And uh, Jerry did have it. Uh, we just had a, one of his nieces just uh, earlier or in mid last year, she had a heart attack out of, out of the blue. So, uh, yeah, there is that gene. Uh, actually, I've been tested. I'm good. <laughs> I had heard he, he had opened an antique shop after he retired. Yeah, he, well, he had a, well, he had that before he retired. He never really retired. Uh, but he, uh, yeah, he had that on Wellington Street, but he also had a butcher shop. You know, sometimes <laughs> if you want to get a lot of people, you could just let us, I could work with some of my other cousins and my sisters and my, my brother. Uh, can my brother work with Jerry at the, uh, when my father died, Jerry had a, a butcher shop right across from the LaSalle Hotel on the Lucy Street, right where near Sam Mandia had his um, fruit store, or the, the Mandia's fruit store was there. And uh, my brother would go and work with him, and Jerry would give us some extra meat and stuff like that, because he, he knew that, you know, like, my mother was making ends meet on her own. So there is one person that's very interesting, and I don't know if she's going to unmute. She is actually a distant cousin, and our family on my grandmother's side were Scottish and Prussian, and she was there. Um, I saw her brown. Um, I don't know if she's gone now. Anyways, um, I forget her first name. There's so many people in my family that. That me? You mean yeah, Tom? Karen. Yeah, Karen. Karen. Yes, Karen. we. Yeah. When you saw the picture, that one of them was your grandfather, right? Was it Norman? <laughs> Norman was my grandfather, that's right. Yeah. And we, we share our great grand, one set of great grandparents, yes. yes. And so, Alyssa, your grandmother was my great aunt, yes. So that, so, that picture, here's what I have. I sent that picture down. I didn't know every, well, I didn't know who they were. And I sent it down to a cousin in LA. And oh. Her, uh, it was um, Alex Rogers' granddaughter. And this oh was some, 10 years ago. And then she knew all the people. Cause she was one of the older ones. So uh, I just wanted to make sure I had all the right names at the right people. You know, I, and I never saw that photograph. I was trying to get a good look at it before the screen went to the next one. <laughs> I'd never well, seen I, Mariah yeah. looking so young, for example. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Do you remember her being a Mariah Webb, right? That's and right, an, yeah. And she's an interesting story because I don't know if any of you are aware, but in Saskatoon, her and her husband, they built this first sort of apartment complex in mm -hmm. Saskatoon. And it was noted as uh, Web Apartments. Web Block. Web yes. Block, that's it. Yeah, uh -huh. it was a Web Block they built. So that's, uh, but she, that's why she was quite rich. And she swore she'd never give any of her money to her nephews. Did you ever hear that, Karen? <laughs> uh, well, I knew that she left money to some nieces for sure. I'm not sure if I, she may have yeah, left my, my Aunt Mary got some of the money. 
Yes. yes. <laughs> and I, they, when she had moved out west, I remember the story was that they had lived in a log cabin, and there were there were the, several Aunt Mariah stories. She, yeah. she, you know, you mentioned the barbers being able to speak their mind. I, I think Aunt Mariah sort of. <laughs> well, I, well, even with my grand, uh, my grandmother, when she went to the school and she spoke to the the teacher, she said he'll never apologize. Because that's another story, and I have that on video re recited by my uncle Jack to me. And just that Ben thought it was a little too long, but uh, some of the time we'll have to maybe put it with the Auto Historical Society. Anyway, so he uh, he didn't have to. She said she put him in a public school, and at the time the uh, Catholic school board was really hurting for tax money. So I think they looked at that side of it, and so she she had, she knew agency. But after seeing reading more stories of my grandfather, I think she just didn't want him to go down and get into a fight with the teacher. <laughs> so you know we usually charge for organizing these family reunions tom but <laughs> well you know i i did take a look at the list of participants and there's a sea of people that i don't know but i know i'm related to so so hello <laughs> yeah. so all the barbers there was mike sanamore he was a great grandson of alex rogers he was on uh i didn't see the whole list so uh there are more you know there's a, quite a few uh you know, because you're not going to know Le LeBlanc, there was Michael LeBlanc, he's, you know, I, there's a ton of people that are related to us, but they, you know, they, uh, they have another last name, you know, they don't deserve the barber last name, and, you know, we have always... <laughs> One of the questions... <laughs> One... Lewis, I recognize the, the surname of Lewis, Brett Lewis, I think, was on, and That's I right. don't, yeah. I don't so know he... him. But Brett, when I was okay. when yeah, I was snooping ahead. around on Ancestry, there was a, another Lewis that had a lot of information, and I was yeah. able to look at that. So I, I, I recognize yeah. that name. So there, there. Yes, Jill, uh, uh, act, this is Brett. Hi, Brett. Uh, yeah, Brett. Uh, rather, Joe Barber was my grandfather, and Eleanor Barber was my mother. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So. Nice so, to meet you. Marion, nice to meet Marian. you. It turned your camera on, Brett, so we... Yeah, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess... He's, I he's, on. he's very dark. Oh, he's very dark. <laughs> Can you see me? There, there we go. go. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you. Got a TV in the background here. Yeah. <laughs> Sitting in my office. It does feel like a family reunion. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. This was this has been incredible. I've, I've enjoyed every minute of it. Yeah. Yeah, so, so what happened, I'm going to tell you a story, a bit of a story. So some of my other cousins might be on. Um, you might have uh, uh, Ken Barber and Valerie. Uh, they might be on. So anyways, when we were kids, I had to tell them. They, they were just like, um, I had to tell them that you're more Native Indian than you are Black. Because they, they weren't fully aware of that fact. Their grandmother died long before they were born. Uh -huh. So... Uh, so we have, you know, like our family is just right across the board, you know, uh, of everything, so, uh, ethnic wise, so. Kind of like our country itself. That's right. People used to ask me, what are you? I said, I'm a Canadian. <laughs> What's your background? Canadian. Because well, uh, the, the Browns came here in the 1830s before Canada was a country, so. Right, Karen? Well, again, oh, I, 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 I'm still looking. <laughs> okay. Again, I want to thank you very much, Tom, okay. and let everybody else know that our next presentation will be in exactly five weeks from tonight. We're always going with the last Wednesday evening of the month. Uh, we will hopefully eventually get